for those just joining welcome and we will get started in a few minutes we're just letting folks kind of trickle in from the <laughs> trickle in from the um waiting room and it'll just take us a few minutes to get we had over 800 people registered for this webinar so it'll just take us a little bit of time to let people kind of bounce in so just hold tight and we we will be with you shortly Hey everyone, just another message that we'll get started in just a minute or two. We're just waiting for our full group to make it in to the webinar. It takes a little bit of time to let everyone filter in. So just hang tight and we will get started in just a minute. All right, everyone, folks are still kind of working their way into the room, so it'll just be about one more minute before we will go ahead and get started with some administrative announcements, and then we will get this show on the road. Okay, let's go ahead and get going and we'll start with some administrative announcements. So for folks who are still trickling in, we will um, you know, not quite get started for another minute or so. So here are a few things to know about this. CLE credit will be available. I will be putting the, um, I should say, I'll start by saying, my name is Tara Antoni Pillay, and I'm the chair of Wellbeing Week in Law. By now, I think I feel like you all know me um, from after 
several days of webinars, but I should have started with that. And I am just going to go ahead and um, make a few announcements before we get started. CLE credit will be available. I will be putting a link into the chat that is a link to apply for a certificate if you need one. There will be two sets of poll questions released. One can be released now, Linda, if you don't mind doing that, and one will be released um, at, right before the Q&A. And these poll questions, we would love to have your feedback on. They are also a way of us confirming for the CLE powers at B that, that you are here and that you are participating in the webinar. So if you would like CLE credit, please go ahead and answer those polling questions. And then the other question that we've been getting a lot is about recordings, all of the recordings for the programs for this week, as well as any supporting materials that have, are available will be posted on the I Will site on Monday. And those will be located on the individual Wellbeing Week in Law page, right exactly where the registration link was. There will be a recording link uh, instead. So you'll be able to use those um, as well. And then if you have any other questions, feel free to let me know. Sometimes people don't see the polls. If the poll doesn't come up for you, I will put my email in the chat and you can just email me and we will make sure that you get CLE credit if you need it. So we are super excited to close out Wellbeing Week in Law this week with a really, really wonderful program, the aim of which is to kind of try and think about how we can integrate many of the different things that we've talked about this week in Wellbeing Week in Law and think about how we can create workplaces that support emotional well-being. And so I'm super honored and thrilled to have with me today three really amazing panelists. Um, Chris Murray. Murray is here from, from Covington. Chris is a transformational public health and well-being leader and speaker. She has 15 years of progressive leadership experience. She specializes in developing sustainable well-being strategies for organizations and developing well-being programs from nuts to bolts. She is currently uh, in residence at Covington and Burling as their director of well-being, and her mission is to increase community care in the workplace. Chris earned her master's degree in public health policy and management from Johns Hopkins and is a certified wellness practitioner through the National Wellness Institute. So please join me in wel welcoming Chris. We also have Gavin Alexander and Gavin Alexander is the wellness director of Jackson Lewis, a law firm with over 950 attorneys and 60 offices. Gavin graduated from Harvard Law School magna cum laude in 2012, practiced as a corporate lawyer for seven years at a large international firm, and prior to joining Jackson Lewis, he was the full-time fellow of the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court Standing Committee on Lawyer Wellbeing. He currently serves on that committee and on the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee of the Institute for Wellbeing in Law the ABA Commission on Lawyer Assistance Programs and the Lawyers Depression Project. So join me in welcoming Gavin. And finally, uh, we have Nicole DeNamer and Nicole is the founder of Sustainable Strategies. Prior to launching Sustainable Strategies, Nicole practiced construction and insurance coverage law in the Seattle area for more than 10 years. Her work focuses on creating collaborative spaces and uniting diverse groups to mitigate climate change through the built environment. Nicole is passionate about creating sustainable and inclusive spaces that support health and wellness. She maintains numerous sustainable building credentials, including well AP and faculty, lead green associate, fit well ambassador, and eco districts AP. So join me in welcoming Nicole. And we are, you can see the poll results here, participants and panelists, and we will go ahead and get going. I'm going to hand it off to Chris first.
All right, can everyone hear me and see the presentation? <laughs> okay, fantastic. I just wanna start off by just saying thank you for Tara for having us here and just all the amazing work that you've been doing this week to make Wellbeing Week and Law a success. It's just really amazing to see all the things that you've done, um, the whole committee has done to, to make this happen. So today my job is really to share steps with all of you to think about how emotional well-being can be an organizational priority rather than just a nice benefit to have. And it doesn't really matter where you are in the process, whether your firm is just starting off by building a well-being strategy or they've been prioritizing it for years, I do think that there'll be something for everyone in my little 10 minute talk. So before we dive in, a very quick and necessary disclaimer, the views expressed are my own and do not necessarily reflect those of Covington or its clients. But thank you for listening. All right. <clears throat> so I'm a very firm believer in just starting off with talking about the basis and building on a foundation. And as the well-being director, I am always asked this question over and over again, which is what is mental health anyway? So why not start there? Mental health, I like to think of it as what uh, is a person's overall psychological and emotional well-being, which encompasses their state of mind, their emotions, and their health, which I feel often gets left out. And all of those things combined can affect behavior, how they feel about themselves, and how they relate to others. But most importantly for this conversation, it can affect the way that they handle the demands that are placed on them. And understanding that is really key for the legal industry because we need highly productive people, highly connections oriented people in order to churn out really good client work. So when I added this slide, I was thinking about mental health is often talked about as a linear spectrum with individuals experiencing varying degrees of well being, mental health, and different aspects of their lives, but it's always linear, right? With people experiencing optimal mental health or flourishing on one side. And then on the other side of the spectrum, individuals experience significant mental health challenges like anxiety or depression or mental health disorders. And I think those people are often seen as languishing or struggling, and that can be really, really harmful because we know that this is not necessarily true. Right. This is where people are saying, I'm perfectly normal. I'm well adjusted. I never need to speak about mental health because I have it all together. But we know that mental health evolves and it shifts. It's incredibly complex and people don't live in the extremes. They can, but it's more human for people to move around the quadrants, depending on where they are in their lives, the environments that they're living in where they're working and how that place is thinking about mental health and well-being and how they protect human life in that space. And also thinking about the individual and how they understand themselves at a particular point in time, which also is always changing. And we know that a person with a diagnosed mental health condition can be on the high flourishing side of the scale because they've learned coping mechanisms and strategies to manage that condition. So that doesn't necessarily impact their everyday life. So I think the first thing is just thinking about the way that we define mental health and being able to talk about the spectrum as a moving quadrant, as a place that shifts and changes as one of the ways we start to navigate and break down stigma within the industry. Now I'm always asked a second really big question. And that is, do, is mental health the responsibility of just the individual? And my answer to that is no. It is not just the responsibility of the individual because it is important for people to think about how to take care of themselves, how to navigate their boundaries in the context of their work and what's expected of them. But also mental health is very, very affected by context like we were just saying. And as we work in a really high pressure environment, working on sensitive topics, polarizing issues with really long hours, it's important for us to understand how we together make sure that people are living and working and feeling good in their skin while they're doing their work. And that's really hard to do, especially if there aren't role models 
that are doing this and the years of stigma and culture perfectionism that's deeply entrenched in this industry makes it hard to put yourself first, right? Especially when we're not supposed to put ourselves first. We're supposed to put clients first. So that makes it really dissonant. If you were here on Tuesday for the webinar on the Surgeon General's workplace well-being framework, you already know that there are five factors that can affect emotional well-being. For those of you that weren't here, it's pretty simple. People need to feel safe. People need to feel connected. They need to feel like they matter and that they have purpose, that they have growth opportunity. And also, they need to feel like they can take care of their own needs and the needs of the people in their lives, their loved ones that they care about. And we know that mental well-being is a really big business imperative because when people feel undervalued, when they feel that harmful pressure of perfectionism, their work is affected. And so I like to think of the factors that impact emotional well-being in a series of questions. And I won't go through all of these questions here today, but I've highlighted some of the ones that I think often um, are ones that we can start with that we, we think about in terms of the four different quadrants, right? So we have emotion. How do I feel? Do I feel valued? Do I feel connected? Social functioning, how I relate to others. People need to feel connected. Am I able to be my most authentic version of myself in order for me to connect and be related to others? Am I able to exercise self-efficacy and can I make mistakes? And that's really hard and legal because we need to put out excellent work. But there's a difference between excellence and perfectionism. Doing excellent work means that we are thinking about the work that we're doing, we're being detail-oriented, which can be really good, but we're not leaning into pressuring other people to make, to make sure every little thing is right all of the time. We're making room for mistakes. And then is the work that I'm doing giving me purpose? These are the questions that we need to ask ourselves when we're thinking about policy, when we're thinking about procedures, and we're going to go a little bit more into that. I love data, and so I have a few to present with you today. And so in the 2022 Bloomberg's Workplace and Workload Hours Survey, they surveyed nearly a thousand lawyers and they explored a couple different questions. They asked, how much do we work? How much are you billing for work? How satisfied are you, are, are you with your jobs? And how do you think about your well-being? How are you doing with your well-being? And less than half of the survey, of the lawyer surveyed said that they were feeling satisfied with their jobs. And the number one thing that they said impacted that dissatisfaction was the inability to disconnect from work. And when asked, about those challenges, they also reported experiencing high level of disrupted sleep, 72%, and 65% were experiencing anxiety. Now, all of these things are related, right? Because mental health is impacted by context. So going back to our mental health continuum, it's really unlikely that those folks are flourishing. They may be high functioning, but that doesn't mean that they are flourishing or being the best legal professionals they can be, or the best parents they can be, or the best community members that they can be. We can also see here that over the past six months, lawyers identify that they felt burnt out 49% of the time. And research shows that when people are experiencing burnout, they're more likely to end up taking sick days, not being the most productive, and even ending up in the emergency room. So, these are important things to, to recognize. When it comes to well-being and emotional health in particular, I like to be a realist. And a lot of our anxieties and struggles that people are facing that come from dealing with mental health and is, is not really unique to one firm or to another. In reality, we are all competitors. Legal professionals, attorneys especially, we're competing with each other for slots. Firms are competing with each other for clients. And that is capitalism. We can't change that. But there are some things 
that shouldn't be about competition. Some things should be about the way that we practice and that we have standards that we that we have thought about and that we've come together as leaders to establish. And I think one of the things we forget to talk about is where the industry is going. And I think it's unfair to expect that any one firm have all the answers. It is the responsibility of leaders and leading bodies to set ground level expectations for what they expect to see in terms of where the industry is going around diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, and emotional health. And I think that those factors are important for the sustainability of the people doing the work. Even things like the CLE credits, we should be offering more and expanding the opportunities for people to be able to get them. So people do attend trainings and different things like this amazing series that we're putting on with I Will. But it's hard to get CLE credits for things like well-being and the legal industry. For individual firms, there are so many things that we can be doing to create a safer, more supportive environment. And it starts with integrating well-being into all aspects of firm life and expectation. And thinking about reducing the silos between different departments so that the, we are mission oriented and creating an emotional, well, an emotionally whole environment. Because well being touches every single aspect of the firm, from recruitment efforts to retirement. We might not be able to reduce the workload that people have, but we can reduce undue stress by being clear about what the firm offers that can assist with managing work and how we can navigate work-life integration. We should be reviewing our policies and procedures to make sure that they are both expansive and inclusive of the human experience. And when I say expansive, I like to think about gender um, and how different genders experience the world and how that affects uh, their ability to work. Um, I think about uh, language in terms of the way that we talk about talent, right? And how important it is for us to think of all of the folks that are working together as talent because we're all pushing forward the work of the firm. Um, I also think about how communication and tone is 90% of the battle. If people understand the why of why certain things are happening, they're less, of, less, of, less likely to object to the what. So be honest. And I find that often firms don't tell you why they've put certain things in place. And instead, they just tell you, this is what we're doing. We're moving to three days a week, but why? <laughs> uh, and I think also there's a lot of resources that should be over-communicated and not hidden because we want people to know what they are and how to find them. All right, we're running out of time. So I'm just gonna move forward. Uh, these are some policies and procedures that I think could be helpful to provide you with all the questions that you have for reviewing policies and procedures from an emotional well-being perspective. So there's a couple of questions that I like to think of. What is the purpose of this policy? Is the goal being communicated with what with what is written? Are these policies written in ways that are unintentionally gendered? Are different experiences that affect emotional well being being taken into account? Like for bereavement leave, has miscarriage been named explicitly for parents? Is there assumptions about family conven conventions? And is that causing undue burden? Um, are policies clear about how people can take space from work if needed? Do your work travel policies make it easy and sustainable for people to do their jobs? Or does it have built-in barriers or high upfront costs that may stoke undue stress? Is your feedback system providing safe ways for individuals to provide feedback to team leaders? These are all really big questions. And then finally, some of you are there like, I can't fix any of these things in my firm. I'm just a community member, what can I do? So I wanted to leave you all with something as well. Everyone has a role to play in creating an emotionally whole workplace, no matter where you sit in the firm, because we're all doing really good work. 
make space for relationships. Relationships are the number one protective factor against burnout. So make space to get to know people, find out what they need to thrive every single day and notice when things are changing for them. That's the number one thing you can do and practice really good, practice really good allyship. And I know Gavin's gonna talk a lot about that as well. Um, I think that's pretty good. I think on an individual level, communicate your needs and your boundaries and, and learn how to, how to share what you need. Um, and that's all for me. Awesome. Thanks so much, Chris. We're going to throw it over to you, Gavin, and I'm going to spotlight you right now. Great. Thank you so much. I am going to try to share my screen here real quick. It should be this one. All right. Can folks see the slides? Yes. Awesome. Fabulous. Uh, so yes, first off, uh, the quick disclaimer, as Chris mentioned, I'm speaking today in my individual capacity and not on behalf of my firm Jackson Lewis or any other organizations or committees or associations with which I'm affiliated. Uh, as a quick description of myself for anyone who is visually impaired, I am a cisgender white man with a brown with brown hair and a brown beard and a gold suit in front of a virtual background that is a rainbow of hearts. Uh, so jumping in, I'm here today to talk a little bit about the intersection of organizational well-being and diversity, equity, and inclusion. And of course, those are buzzwords. Uh, so I, I really want us to be thoughtful about what we're talking about here today, which really is acknowledging that while there are fa factors affecting the well-being of lawyers and legal professionals from around the country in every capacity, Lawyers and legal professionals from underrepresented, historically excluded, marginalized backgrounds are facing added burdens and stressors that are impacting their well being. And there is data to show that they currently are experiencing worse mental health and physical health outcomes in the legal profession in specific than others in the majority in this profession. So, skip going the agenda for what I'll talk about today, a little bit about that data that already exists to highlight that uh, discrepancy in impact. Then I'll talk a little bit about um, some process oriented suggestions on how to address these issues. And then I'll highlight an example uh, through some of the work being done at the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court Standing Committee on Lawyer Wellbeing, which I will henceforth refer to as the Standing Committee, because that is too long a name to say a million times during this presentation. So, some recent research. Uh, the ALM Intelligence, which is the research arm of the American lawyer, AMLAW, uh, got some data in 2021 highlighting what's on screen right now. The important part here is noting that 19% of the lawyers surveyed contemplated suicide at some point in their careers, but that went up to 31% for Black lawyers. Almost double, or at least 150% for Black lawyers compared to uh, the overall population of lawyers. More recently, uh, Patrick Krill, who has been referenced a number of times this week, uh, is one of the leading researchers in lawyer well-being and mental health. Uh, Patrick and his team have highlighted uh, in a number of studies some discrepancies that are happening for the well-being of lawyers uh, based on uh, identity and demographics. Particularly in their report, Stress, Drink, Leave, they highlighted that um, hold on one second, I need to move this. Um, uh, they highlighted that uh, women were actually uh, experiencing higher levels of stress, depression, anxiety, and hazardous drinking than men. And in one in four women had thought about leaving the profession due specifically to mental health, burnout, or stress. And then even more recently, very recently, around a month and a half ago, uh, Patrick Krill and his team released a new report based on this same California and DC data, highlighting that highly stressed lawyers were 22 times more likely to experience thoughts of suicide than even low stressed lawyers. And specifically, the Krill team highlighted that junior associates, young attorneys, and attorneys working more than 60 hours per week were particularly at risk and suicidal ideation was actually more common among racial and ethnic minorities than among white attorneys. 
Coming out of Massachusetts, where I am based, uh, NORC at the University of Chicago, which is a public uh, interest research organization, did a study of all of the registered lawyers in Massachusetts, uh, which received over 4,000 responses, so a really high response rate for this type of voluntary survey, uh, highlighting what's on screen right there. As you see, consistent with some of the other data, really intense uh, issues affecting the legal population at large, but then specifically in terms of stigma, uh, a really important issue that we don't, that is talked about a lot, but isn't in really concrete terms, I think is really highlighted by this slide, which over around half the lawyers who screened using the medical survey uh, data for severe, moderate to severe depression or anxiety, or only half had sought any care. Similarly, lawyers who had reported recent suicidal thoughts, only half, had ever sought any care. And similarly, lawyers exhibiting hazardous or unhealthy alcohol use, only 2% had sought any support or care. And the number one reason for not seeking care was perceived stigma. Here are some highlights on uh, discrepancies, again, based on demographics. All of these mental health issues, burnout, anxiety, depression, were worse among lawyers who identified as female, non-heterosexual, with a disability, from minority populations within the law, uh, from historically excluded populations within the law, and over a quarter of lawyers reported experiencing bias, harassment, and or discrimination in the legal profession, and specifically, Lawyers, I wanted to highlight, lawyers most frequently reported experiencing those incidents of bias, harassment, and or discrimination from attorneys representing other parties and their places of employment. So that counterparty, whether it's in litigation or on the other side of a deal or your own place of employment, those seem to be the highest play, uh, incidents of bias and discrimination in the legal workplace. New Jersey, uh, this data came out actually a, a few weeks ago, I think similar types of experiences, but New Jersey highlighted one demographic that we haven't talked about as much, which is the junior uh, lawyer in specific. Their data highlights that under th lawyers under 34 years age were four times as likely to report depression as than lawyers over 65. And similarly, lawyers with zero to three experience of practice were uh, zero to three years of practice experience were six times as likely to report depression than those with 40 plus years of practice experience. Now, I want to talk a little bit about an example of what we've done here in Massachusetts to try to actually sort of concretize this data into a more emotional, more relatable form. Because all of these numbers in the world, honestly, I don't think they're going to change people's minds, you, or at least they're not going to convince them to act. You really need to be, when you're thinking about this organizational systemic level, I advocate that you need to be thinking both to change people's minds and change people's hearts. So this, um, we, from a process-oriented standpoint, we wanted to create the opportunity to listen, to not just go to these lawyers from underrepresented and historically pop excluded populations and say, we're gonna solve your problems for you. We wanted to give them the opportunity to tell us in 2020 to 2023, what are the experiences you're actually facing? How are they affecting your well being? And let us amplify the signal of those experiences. And then we can come together to try to come up with some real solutions. So uh, we developed this process where the, the, the standing committee met with seven affinity bar associations over six months. Over 115 lawyers and law students participated. And the goal of these meetings, as I said, was to listen so that we could really create a space where members of these affinity bar associations could speak their truth to power, speak to the leadership of the profession, um, judges from the Supreme Judicial Court and the chairs of the standing committee attended, uh, and we uh, let them share what they'd actually experience. Now, in terms of the next step, when we heard those stories, rather than just going back to the affinity bars and saying, OK, now draft all that up for us which is a, a, something that happens a lot in this space, is lawyers from minoritized or marginalized backgrounds are basically asked to take on the labor of solving their own oppression. 
we took on the labor of saying, okay, we're going to come up with a draft of this report highlighting all of these experiences in an anonymized format. And then we went back to the affinity bars and said, here's our draft. We're going to give you two months to take a look and give us your feedback to make sure we captured everything. And then we finalized it. So it's, it's a really important process uh, perspective that I like to highlight, which is listen, then take on the labor yourself of trying to come up with an idea, trying to come up with a uh, solution, but then make sure you go back to the population you're trying to support and make sure they have the, a real opportunity to weigh in before anything is finalized. So the experiences we we found, you can I can the, share the link to the actual report, um, but these are the overall categories of experiences we, sh we learned about. All the things you'd expect. BIPOC attorneys believed that clients actually would be better served by having a white attorney. BIPOC attorneys waiting in line when white attorneys got to move to the front of the line. BIPOC attorneys regularly having their bar licenses heavily scrutinized. Um, queer and transgender lawyers repeatedly having their genders uh, misnamed, or sorry, the, them being misnamed or misgendered uh, by referring to incorrect pronouns for them, both by judges, opposing litigants, and even witnesses and folks like that. Here's a quote from a law student um, who posted on TikTok, a black female law student from Rhode Island uh, went to court one day and was basically told, oh, we think you're with the defendants. We don't think you're a lawyer um, by the bailiff. And she talks about how much that impacted her mental health and well-being. She said literally, like, why would, <laughs> she said that um, I have never been so embarrassed in my entire life. I felt like crying in that moment. And this, these experiences are all too common and will be remembered by these lawyers for years to come. And if this was experienced in law school, we can only imagine how much it's impacting the rest of the profession. Obviously, issues with inadequate representation, and I'm skipping past a lot of this, but we will send out the slides if folks want them, uh, and the recording will be available so you can pause uh, and look at these uh, in greater detail. Micro and macro aggressions, assuming attorney's pronouns without asking. Positive microaggressions, like commenting on how articulate Black, Indigenous, and people of color lawyers and law students were. Um, having professional conversations in exclusionary locations, like gendered restrooms, private clubs, religious locations, uh, and repeatedly requesting, and this is a big one from organizational well-being standpoint, repeatedly requesting, recommending, voluntelling lawyers from underrepresented groups that they present on panels, attend recruiting events, appear on marketing materials, all of which is non-billable time that all their straight white male non-disabled peers are just sitting at their computers billing and working and generating revenue. And then law firms and legal organizations ask, why are these uh, lawyers from underrepresented communities producing less, billing less, uh, all of this? Well, ask how much non-billable time you're asking them to take up and burden you're placing on them with all of this stuff that makes your organization look good. So in terms of next steps, I wanted to quickly highlight, we organized four working groups to develop concrete structural ideas to improve the well-being of underrepresented lawyers. Um, and I see a typo in my slide there, but from public agencies and legal services, small and medium-sized law firms, large law firms, and private in-house legal departments. The top, we, these working groups were composed of lawyers from junior all the way to the most senior, uh, managing partners of some of the largest firms participated. Uh, and we, there, here are some of the topics that are, by the way, these, these idealists are not public yet, so I can't share the full story with you, but they likely will be getting published within the next month or two. But the idea was to really come up with these big, 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 big lists that cover massive scopes of topics so that any organization could flip through and say, we're looking for an idea on how to improve um, issues we're experiencing with reporting incidents of bias. What can we do? And there, this, so these ideas are organized both by these topics and by early stage, intermediate stage, and advanced stage, so that no legal organization will be able to say, we just don't know what to do right now. We wanted to give as many ideas as possible. So as some quick examples before I finish up, uh, 
for structuring internal DEI advancement, an early stage idea might obviously to be to hire or appoint a chief DEI officer and ensure they have authority to make decisions and execute strategies and is invited to attend and top level meetings and participate in decision making processes in which other top level officers participate. An intermediate stage idea might be to adopt and make public a formal DEI focused strategic plan with concrete goalposts the firm hopes to achieve by specific timeframes. And an advanced stage idea might be to require that any material change to the firm's policies or development of any new material programs be reviewed and discussed with or even consented to by the organization's chief DEI officer, or to require that the firm's compensation and promotion decisions be reviewed specifically to identify whether there are any discrepancies in such determinations which correlate with membership in underrepresented versus overrepresented populations. So that's just an overall highlight and I'll turn it back over to Nicole. But to conclude, the fundamental goals of this type of work from a systemic structural organizational standpoint are to examine what those big level issues are that are contributing to dis uh, disproportionate adverse well-being impacts for certain groups compared to others, brainstorm creative ways to incentivize and or require change in ways to which the organization can be held accountable, and listen to and engage with the actual populations you're trying to support when designing and implementing those ideas. Always keep in mind the phrase, not about us, without us. We need to be at the table if you're designing a solution to try to support us. And I say that as a queer uh, man and as a man with mental health disabilities, with depression, who has gone through suicidal ideation and tried to end my own life while in practice myself, not about us, without us. So I'll turn it back over to Tara. Thank you so much, Gavin. I am going to just briefly uh, pause the recording and go ahead and take you off of the spotlight for a moment. Stop the recording.